By the year 1914 and the onset of the First World War, the slow burn transition from a feudal mindset into a modern liberal democracy had extended the eligible voting electorate to 58% of the male population, strictly confined to the property-owning classes. Of course, this would mean that the remaining 42% of disenfranchised men would make up the male entirety of the lower classes of the demographic for which the lure to war through economic adventure, conscription or reasons of coercion were generally at the greatest. Women, despite being the economic and social beneficiaries of the class in which they were born or married, had their political emancipation tied to those same men at the low half of the class divide, and from their relative positions of privilege and social standing emerged the wealthy landowning spinsters of means, as Winston, Winston Churchill would later regard them. Uh, they were demanding the same right to vote with that of their male counterparts, so not, not so much universal suffrage as as a suffrage for some. Of the vast majority of members of parliament favoured votes for women in some measure and in the years preceding the war the conciliation bill sought to deliver those rights to propertied women. However, its, its exponents found themselves facing considerable moral opposition by MPs and in March 1912 Following repeated failure by the movement's leaders to rein in the WSPU's addiction to violence, the final draft of the conciliation bill was defeated by just 14 votes. This setback infuriated the suffragettes, the primary beneficiaries of the bill, who characteristically found their retribution through further violence. Now, I'm not going to follow in the footsteps of the popular media and play down the level of violence in which the suffragettes were engaged. Uh, first responders and postal workers bore the brunt of the suffragettes' campaign of violence as primary victims of nothing less than the movement's war on the working class, the 42%, who had an equal claim to their political enfranchisement. Aside from being badly burned by arson attacks, fires were caused by phosphorus, the fumes from which were caused cause permanent lung damage to those heroes tasked with tackling the raging flames. Postal workers were badly burned when packages they were handling exploded and caught fire, and disfigurations were caused as they handled letters which had been drenched in concentrated hydrochloric acid. Livelihoods were ruined, and in the summer of 1914, the suffragettes' campaign culminated in a nail bomb at Westminster Abbey during peak tourism. At the outbreak of war, the suffragettes declared a cessation of all militant activity in order to concentrate on the war effort and almost immediately began lobbying to institute an involuntary universal draft or conscription and, and by extension masquerading as a patriotic push to civic duty of the notorious and insidious White Feather campaign came into fruition. implementation of the white feather as a symbolic tool of coercion was originally initiated by Charles Fitzgerald of the Royal Navy for the purpose of bolstering up the front line but the suffragettes zealously seized the opportunity of exerting tyrannical power over the male populace and, and this quickly morphed into a period of history where it was common occurrence for young men to find themselves publicly accosted by groups of women invasively fussing these symbols of cowardice upon their person with the aim to shaming men into enlisting in the British army. The suffragettes and their supporters led nothing less than a campaign of harassment and intimidation against all those of service age who appeared in public spaces in civilian clothing. There is an interesting article in the Daily Mail online that gives the perspective of a victim of the campaign that, that I will read to you. James Lovegrove was only 16 when he was confronted by a group of women on his way to work. He wrote, They started shouting and yelling at me, calling me all sorts of names for not being a soldier. Do you know what they did? They stuck a white feather in my coat, meaning I was a coward. Oh, I did feel dreadful, so ashamed, I went to the recruiting office. Despite initially being told to go away because he was underage, the recruiting sergeant eventually took pity on him and falsified his measurements. <laughs> 
Anonymous letters help us to encapsulate the emasculatory vitriol that was delivered upon the unfortunate Lovegrove by his assailants, as these letters sent to young men and boys, some as young as 14, were to extend the theme of cowardice into the homes and workplace of their victims. Wear this brooch and bullions in your frilly white dress. Chicken you are. For a coward, why not take the king's shilling and defend your country? Trench dodger chicken heart an invitation to join that girl scout if you're too proud or frightened to fight wear this and the enclosed white feather rotten hell by virtue of their youth these young men and boys were emotionally underprepared for the shock of having their value to society simultaneously evoked and trashed in a, in a cruel display of public and private humiliation leaving many shamed and emasculated recipients of the white feather endeavouring to tear themselves from the deep emotional attachment of friends and family and volunteer themselves for the terror of the trenches. Their fate has been fully documented in history alongside all those who fought and died in the Great War, the vast majority of whom would never have had any entitlement to vote. As for the victims of the white feather who lacked the constitution to necessitate the self-preservative instinct, that canal of truth bore upon them the indelible character of cowardice and as a result of the campaign, suicides were recorded. Two white feathers framed in a question mark with the word coward in a girl's handwriting drove a boy to kill himself. When 17-year-old Bernard Sills received them by post, he put on his cadet uniform, picked up his rifle, and was later found dead in a Tottenham Raid shelter with the rifle beside him. Cyril Ray from Oxford was found dead with a rubber tube from a gas jet attached to his gas mask after receiving a white feather through the post together with an offensive letter. A second white feather was also sent to him with a note suggest suggesting he was a conscientious objector. Having successfully helped lobby to institute an involuntary universal draft by 1916, with an exemption for women of course, the suffragettes were finally granted their wish and from that moment every adult male was subject to military law without any voice in the matter. If he didn't go quietly, he could be forcibly removed from his home and transported to the front where, if he protested, he might be subjected to a cursory field court-martial and executed by firing squad. Angry Harry writes on his website, John Kirkwood, a gunner in the Royal Field Artillery, joined up after being sent a white feather implying he was a coward. He was killed at the Somme on the 26th of July 1916. In 1916, while the suffragettes were moaning about the lack of vote for, for women and also handing out white feathers to those men who were not wearing military uniform, 20,000 British men were killed on the very first day of the Battle of the Somme, and a further 125,000 British men were killed during the next five months in this battle alone. But according to the suffragettes, it was women who were being oppressed. When feminists continue, continually to complain to the world about how oppressed were women in the days of the generation that preceded mine, and I think of the generals sending tens of thousands of men to their certain deaths simply in order to do their calculations, or when I think of those men who had to continue to live in permanently handicapped state for the rest of their lives, I have arisen within me from somewhere an almost uncontrollable urge to spit at them. The historical record has firmly established that many women enthusiastically participated in this discriminate and opportunistic extension of militant activity, a campaign that began in 1914 and continued long after conscription in 1916, only, only to resurface again during the Second World War. It reached such proportions globally that a badge was issued to be given to officers and men who had left the services on health grounds in an attempt to mitigate against the menace. The Representation of the People Act 1918 was passed after the war. As a mass expansion in democratic principles, this act was the first to include almost all men over the age of 21 in the voting system and the inclusion of all women over the age of 30. This age threshold prevented women from forming the majority of the electorate and instead were resolved to accounting for 43% overall. Full parity with men was to be established 10 years later in 1928 
when the Representation of the People Act was introduced and all women 20, 21 years were granted equal enfranchisement with their male counterparts. To this day, the Representation of the People's Act 1918 is widely celebrated as the pivotal achievement of the women's rights movement in their fight against patriarchal oppression and toward female emancipation. It is less well observed that hundreds of thousands of highly trained and battle-hardened military combatants were returning home from war into mass unemployment and economic depression. Their appeasement through political enfranchisement may have been the masterstroke enabling the minority of power holders to prevent civil war on British soil and the fracturing of the historical timeline reverberating into an unrecognisable present. Thank you.